Hey everyone, welcome to The Flip Side with your host Chris and Sean. We're a podcast rambling about the interesting questions in the world of movement. Welcome back to The Flip Side Podcast. Today we've got guest Tyler back on and we are going to be talking about seasonal training. So he's got four seasons laid out and I, I mean, let's just do a quick overview. Tyler, uh, let's get an overview of what it is that you've got laid out here. Yeah, so um, I know last time I was on, I talked a little bit about the seasonal training, and I just wanted to go more into depth um, today with you guys about it. So the idea of seasonal training, kind of like I mentioned before, is this whole idea that if you think of like a professional athlete, you know, they have their competing season where they're like, you know, think of football where they're going to try to win. They go through a playoffs, they go, they try to win a championship. That is that athlete's season. Um, they're in season particularly, and then they transfer to an off season and then a post season and then a preseason. So they kind of go through this four season mentality where they're, it's very performance focused. And if you rethink about professional athletes, they're getting paid millions of dollars. It's really important for them to have strong bodies that last a good time. The team is it's advantageous for a sports team to hang on to a really good player for really long. So they're going to do everything in their power to make sure that player stays healthy. Um, Taking that logic and applying it to tricking, that's what the concept of the seasonal training is. is We have this interesting issue with tricking where tricking can be done all the time. There's not like a competing season or anything like that. So people can, if they have a gym access, trick at a high level all the time. And I think that is part of the reason why people in tricking are getting injured quite a bit. You know, we've seen a lot of Achilles tears recently. Um, And why people feel like once they hit a certain age, they have to stop tricking. Like, oh, adulting is, my adult life is getting in the way. I can't session as much now, or I'm getting older. So like, I feel more aches and pains now. I think that's a product, not of the sport, but a product of how we treat our bodies and not treating them quite enough like how an athlete treats their body. I think I think that's a really good point. Yeah, you said that far better than I could have. So great overview. Um, I think that it's going to be difficult because there are gatherings which you might we might label as competitions. Um, there are battles at them, and uh, with adrenaline doing this belt system thing, um, there might be you know something bigger happening there, um, but. It's been, I feel like it's going to be difficult with everyone kind of having their own gatherings going on, not really uh, doing anything more than the only reason that they talk at all is to just make sure they don't fall on each other's time, which is actually worse for the athletes, right? Yeah. Because because now they have to compete all the time. Um, so uh, my biggest question right away is, is how long are these seasons? Uh, like, yeah. is there a way to do a mini version of them to prepare for each gathering or is would it be a year long thing? I think it would be a year long thing. Um, So the thing is like, regardless of the season, it's an important thing with tricking too, is tricking is a huge skill-based sport as well. So tricking athletes don't get a benefit by not tricking at all. Like technique falls, like I'm sure, regardless of where you're at as a tricker, you can feel like if you just take, if you took a month off for some reason, you come back, your timing on things is off and you lose those skills really quickly unless you're always practicing them. We do have interesting things like, training things on trampoline, which helps with like twisting and helps with double flips and things like that. Um, But regardless of the season, you're always tricking at least one to two times a week. Um, Something I do want to say about that really quick. We do have like these, uh, these times where someone will have like a chronic injury where they'll leave and come back. I think McCoy is a really good example where he's known for leaving the sport for months at a time and then coming back and still being able to do triple cork with zero training. Maybe he's retaining um, trampoline stuff, but I think that this does apply when you're trying to train at a high level. Like at what point are you like losing skills? That's like per person. You can't just say like I'm retaining skills. So if anyone was going to argue with that, I would say that, um, you're probably causing more long-term yeah. effects by coming back so quickly, almost like you just had an ACL tear and you're jumping back in. It's that same idea as like you took time off and you're going to jump back in. Yeah. You might be able to still do the skills. You might still have the skills, but it's still not good. So and I, and I, I agree with the, you. I also think the skill is relative to the person. So like the example of that person, you said that triple corks, it's like, 
you take all the people that can triple cork, all of them would probably rate triple cork differently in terms of like difficulty. So like, like, you yeah. know, Michael Guthrie's off season for sure, right. where he's like reducing his threshold down maybe a little bit to recover. He could probably still do significantly more stuff than the average person because that's his like easier level. Maybe it's like, you know, you can hit triple cork coming out of like a one or two month season, but maybe hitting it in a combo where your air awareness of like transitioning momentum is a little bit different, but it's like, if it's just your strongest setup that you've drilled, you know, a million times, like you probably won't lose that as much. Yeah. So absolutely. Yes. I agree with you there. Okay. So, sorry. I pulled you off there. Yeah. No, don't wreck again. So yeah, <laughs> looping back to the season. So the seasons break up evenly to about a three month window. So that makes a complete year, give or take a couple weeks, however you do it. Um, and that's just the purpose that, the body takes around like nine to 12 weeks to adapt to a new stimulus. So say we're just talking about working out in a gym and you hop on a new program. That's a, say you're, you know, you're trying to work towards, you know, a bodybuilding competition or a strength competition or a powerlifting competition. Um, a, a program is going to be laid out usually by a good coach, like nine to 12 weeks. And then they're going to cycle you through a new program after the nine to 12 weeks, it's not necessarily maybe all new stuff, but the sets and reps change, the tempo changes, the exercises build on each other. And that's because around that time, you want to switch up and build off of what you did. Um, any less than that, and you might not get adapted enough to the workout. So whether it's again, tricking or working out or nutrition, your body might take two to three weeks just to get like in tune with what you're trying to get it to do. And then now you're like coasting, you're doing really good with the new program. You don't want to just take that away and immediately go to something else. You want to give the body time to adapt to the new change and then make those changes. So that's why I like the three month window. And again, it's not super, super strict to three months. Like, you know, if there's this gathering you want to go to and you, you're, you want to throw down really hard and it's two to three weeks away from when you would normally be quote unquote competing um, you know, that's perfectly okay. There's that flexibility there. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's jump into season one. Um, just, uh, let's start with preseason. That makes the most sense. Yeah. So as like a quick overview going through each season. So I changed the terms a little bit to not use the preseason season okay. term. So I okay. labeled it as, um, the first season would be recover and then it goes into build and then it goes into prepare and then it goes into perform. Um, that would be the overlay of each of the four seasons. So the first season, I label recover as the first season because most trickers, if they like picked up my book or heard about me or wanted to give this a try, this is where they would start. Because I would say most trickers haven't been doing this, you know, maybe the ones that have been in the game for really long, they're, they're veterans of the sport. They know how to battle injuries and work around things. They're probably like intuitively doing this. If you look at the people that are like, have been tricking 10 plus years and have always been tricking at a high level. Genetics may have a component to that, but I bet they were have really good health habits outside of tricking. And they probably throughout the year do different forms of like increasing and decreasing intensity. Yeah. And whether it's on purpose or not. And that's actually funny because right before you jumped on, that's what I was saying to Sean. I was saying, I'm really interested yeah. to get in this because I do something very, very similar. Like that's how I got to the point I'm at so quickly was because I was doing this kind of up and down training regimen thing. So, yeah. So i um, starting with recover. Like, so every season again, breaks down into a nutrition focus, a training focus, that's weightlifting, mobility, session, stretching, and then a tricking focus. So each season changes and ebbs and flows into the, uh, the amount of things you're doing and the focus. So kind of working on nutrition first for recovery. It's as simple as the name of the season. The goal is to recover. Um, and how we recover is it's really important to not just focus on food, but like food quality is huge and sleep and stress. So again, okay. we're, we burn our bodies out doing a high intense sport. You know, when we're doing that, we're not really caring as much about you know, food quality, how much we're eating, are we getting enough carbs, fats, protein? Um, are we sleeping enough? How's our stress level? Again, this is another bigger topic for maybe not kids who are 18 and younger, but kids who are people who are adults now where you have competing stressors in life too. You have a job, you have college or post-college, you have maybe even a family if you're an older tricker. So there's these competing stressors and 
the body essentially can only take on so much stress in life. Um, tricking is a huge stress. And if you love tricking, you have to get really good at learning how to manage that stress threshold that your body can take on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, something I want to get into, this is, this is what I'm really curious about. What did the different nutrition aspects look like in each season? Like, so we were in the recover one right now. What specifically makes that one stand out? And then yeah, same so, thing with the training. So this is just really just an opportunity to like, if, if there was a season where your food was the best quality and the most in tune with what your body needs in terms of like calories, protein, uh, water, vitamins, nutrients, micronutrients, it would be in the recovery season, just to make sure your body has all the things it needs to repair itself. So it's almost like eating. bulking. It's almost like in a bulking season. Kind of. So the, that's where the build season comes in. So the okay. second season, uh, that is where you're quote unquote bulking. So that's a calorie increase. Gotcha. Um, it really okay. helps to get a really good, healthy baseline before bulking. Because again, like if food quality is not good, other things aren't great, someone might go into a bulk and then eat not necessarily the best foods to bulk and gain weight. There is definitely a right way to bulk. You know, there's a, like a weightlifting term, like a dirty bulk or a normal. Um, so we don't want that again, as tricking athletes, we also want to stay as light as possible. I mean, yeah. thinking if you're an anime fan, I know you are Chris, but like the whole idea of like, there's the episode in the series of Dragon Ball Z where they're like trying to figure out how to go like from Super Saiyan 1 to Super Saiyan 2 and like Vegeta and Trunks get all like super, super buff. And then Goku is like, that's not the way you're getting too big. Like, right, right, right. Fast enough. Um, so there is hey, if you enjoy our content and you want to show some support, make sure you follow us on Spotify and Instagram. Our Instagram tag is the underscore flip underscore side underscore podcast. Make sure to go on there. Just shout out like old episodes that you liked, anything about the new episodes. You can comment on any of them. We would really appreciate it. And if you do end up wanting to go a step further, just become a supporter. All you have to do is follow the link in the description in any of our episodes that we've published. And you can also go under the about section in our Spotify homepage. You can do as little as 99 cents a month. Any amount that you guys support us is going to help us build a better podcast and help build better trickers around the world. Um, so there is a level to the point at which like, <laughs> you can put on so much muscle that you're not going to trick at a high level. Um, yeah. So and that's, can... that's super legit. And I actually have personal experience with that because I grew up on the farm. I got super, super big. And I was retaining that muscle while I was tricking, not on purpose. And then I completely switched my diet and I stopped lifting completely for a year. I stopped and I lost so much muscle mass, but I it's still super cut, super strong, but not, you know, it's all, I was like, okay, well, if I completely switch what I'm doing, it, my body will adapt. It's going to change what it needs. You know, it's not going to yeah, keep what exactly. it doesn't need. So and again, yeah. as we as we trick a lot, like our body's gonna hold on to muscle that's useful for us as a whole. So, like again, the bulking season is three months out of the year, whereas the other uh, nine months you're focusing mostly on what your body needs from a tricking perspective. So your right. body's gonna have that demand most of the year to tell you like this muscle's important, this muscle's not. And again, that's yeah. also why the bulking season is it's only three months long. It's really just to fill in the gaps because again over time the thing with tricking from the build section is that we imbalance our body out with how we trick you know most people yeah. don't evenly trick to both sides you know we don't we're not twisting as much to one side as the other there's very rare people that are like doing past double cork on both sides like effectively you know and even then i don't find that um i don't find it a positive thing like i just feel like if you're doing double cork on one side it's just bad for you. If you're doing cork on your other side, it's just twice as bad for you. I don't think it's <laughs> like, in my opinion, it's not really balancing you out in the long run. I think that like you're talking about the training section, especially during the bulk season, that's when you really get all those kinks out. Um, so talking about that nutrition board. So this is really just like, you're trying to get the most even intake of food. Um, something I've heard is that, uh, doing like a lower calorie count while you're healing and even fasting while you're healing. Do you know, do you know anything or can you talk on that at all? So it's kind of like a controversial thing. So this would be like in a seat in like the season one or the, uh, like the recovery phase. Yeah. So there's this talk of like fasting, what's called cell autophagy, where it's like in a fasted state or in a lower calorie state, your body's better at like cleaning up 
uh, like dead tissue and different things like that. Um, again, that's a that does happen, but it's very you have to to maximize that. You have to almost have zero other stress going on in your life, so that your body has the again the capacity to take on the stress of fasting a calorie deficit, and then use those resources to clean up stuff. So okay. I think it can clean up maybe sort of dead tissue, but in terms of repairing, repairing is is the same as building muscle to an right. extent, um, which can't happen in a calorie deficit. So it's like it might lengthen the recovery process of an injury if the, if food's not in a good spot. So that's again, I think doing a, a recovery phase every year keeps ideally triggers into like they still maybe have small aches and pains but it never gets to a point that gets unchecked that then turns into a torn Achilles, a torn ACL, or just like losing yourself and like breaking something or tearing something else. Um, right. Um, so we've got Sean right here. That makes me want to ask you. So with this ACL tear that you had, that was pretty serious. And you had what, four of them, right? Um, three three of them. Three. So did Enough. you have any telltale signs that told you that it was, coming up ahead of time or anything of that sort or no, any that's... previous smaller injuries like that? No, I, I had nothing really saying that that was going to happen. I, I don't know if it was like a freak accident. I mean, there could be, there could have been signs for it, but um, like I've always jammed my ankles just from landing wrong, but usually from training, I was landing them fine. I didn't really have a problem. It was just one time for some reason, I felt like I was just too tired and, went into the past and I was just like, well, I gotta do it. So I did. Yeah. And then those other times, those other times that it happened, you felt like you're like, I'm all good. There's no reason anything should happen. It wasn't even on the back. It wasn't even in the back of your mind. It was completely, you were fine. And I think that that this season thing, I think will be really good because having this recovery phase or even just a training phase in general, I think trigger skip is going to like allow you to take a second and just go, okay, what is wrong right like, yeah. what do I need to focus on? Or like, what should I focus on preventing, even if it's not an issue? Sure. Um, and I think that, yeah, just being an acrobat, being, you know, the guys that we are, me and you, Sean, I don't know. I mean, you too, if, if you know, you're a tricker. So of course, you know, we're training and we're just there to, to push, you know, and you get caught up in this thing. You're like, I'll push through it until you get to a point where I definitely have any way where I'm like, it's probably not a big deal until it's a big deal, you know? Yeah. So yeah, taking inventory of all of those tiny injuries is really, really important. So going into the training section of, um, uh, of this first season, what does that look like? We're just in a recovery phase. We're not trying to build too much muscle yet. That's that next one. So is it just kind of moving those muscles around, getting them to, it's like a cool down type of deal yeah, or, so, or what uh... are we doing? So this is the time where it's like really taking inventory. So let's just say like for the sake of it, you like the end of your competing season. So season four, you like go to a big gathering and, and you know, maybe you're battling or you're just there to throw down or again, maybe you're not even competing in something, but you're just ending your season. You just got done grinding for a new skill. Like you're pretty beat up. Okay. January is the start of my recovery season. So what am I going to do? Well, we talked about nutrition. You're just going to get nutrition in check recalculate out your macros, figure out where you need to be, work on food quality. And then training wise, you take inventory of your body. So I think it's important to like sit down and I like, all right, over the past couple of months, like what has been bothering me? And I'm going to like go from small to large. Okay. There's been a couple of times where like, you know, every time I do swings, I know like after 45 minutes of a session, like my plant leg is starting to hurt a little bit in my ankle. I know when I swing too much, like my hip hurts a little bit. Or if I like, you know, you start to categorize like all these little aches and pains that you traditionally have. And, and I think it's of, important too, even if you don't, but yeah. you know, I just only have done swings for this long. You should yeah. probably, even if there's no pain, right? Yeah, you should probably. So, so mental inventory yeah. as, as well as the, you know, physical aches and pains too. So the, the mental inventory is important, but then training as a whole is going to really just look like recovery, rehab, and then mobility. So again, it's really just taking inventory of, we're not in a calorie surplus. We're not going to really be building muscle. We're really just trying to even out any tightness that we built up in our body, you know, doing a lot of unilateral training. So that's the fancy word for just saying like one side at a time. 
-hmm. So we're, I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I, I want to strengthen up my left arm to my right arm, my left leg to my right leg. I'm going to do all these stretches and really, again, just focus three months on if I had any aches and pains, I want them all to be gone and really yeah. just being aggressive with like, you know, again, how aggressive we approach tricking as a whole, like you said, it's like, we want to aggressively approach training now and getting our body feeling a hundred percent. And then during that time, the tricking looks like one to two days a week. It could be up to three, but you're limiting yourself at like, I rated everything like a difficulty. So if you rated Chris, your skills from like as easy as you could do, like a hook kick up to like a triple cork or a cork in or something like that being like nine or 10, something like that. Yeah. It looks like cat tricks that would be like one to three in terms of difficulty. Wow. It's really just basics. It's just tech. You can still do combos. It's really just your trick. You're trying to get your body to still move like a tricker, but not express lots of, I guess, you know, power, if that makes sense. Yeah. No falling. Ourselves. Lots yeah, of sticking, no, no crashing, <laughs> lots of sticking. Okay. You can think of that category as also moves that you feel like you could just stick like a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Okay. And I actually, I did do this. Um, I had this sampler and it was called a one shot sampler. And I was in this season of training where I was like, I'm just going to try to one shot these combos. And if I can't one shot it, then I move on. And that was yeah. basically teaching me, first of all, what level I was at, but it was also keeping me in a safe place position physically because i was like i'm not in a place where i can push myself physically i need to recover so yeah super super cool yeah, um, so like overviewing that as a whole it's like in the recovery phase you're cleaning up food quality making sure you're eating enough um sleeping enough recovery is really good you're listening to your body the goal is trying to get you to feel 100 percent as just a person not necessarily feel 100 percent as a tricker but it's like if you're not functioning and at a healthy level as like a normal non-athletic person, then you're going to be in trouble when you try to keep pushing your body. So nutrition, uh, training looks like lots of recovery, rehab, lots of single side unilateral work, focusing on like mobility, trying to get more, like a lot more flexible. And then tricking looks like, you know, one to three days a week at like a low difficulty. And like, again, there's some spectrum there of like, Yes, you could do basic stuff on ground, but maybe you could do a little bit of harder stuff on trampoline. It's just like, you have to be, you have to like, make sure you put a leash on yourself. Like you said, right. like the whole thing, why the season thing is good is because trickers have a bad habit of like, it's a double-edged sword of how good we are at pushing ourselves. Yeah, It's like, you just go to a session and you're injured and you're like, I'm only going to do, I'm only going to say hi to some friends. And then it turns into, okay, I'm going to do some combos that I know, like don't bother my injury. And then you're like, well, I'm kind of warmed up now. So like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to like throw something that I shouldn't throw. <laughs> <I've done> yeah. <laughs> so yes. it's like trying to keep a leash on our, on ourselves. And I think having like a concrete framework of that's just like, okay, when I'm in this season, this is what I do. Like no ifs, ands, or buts. It's yeah. Like, that's tough. That's tough. Um, but also this is a good season to, uh, like I said, with that one shot sampler, it almost gives you an idea of like, what level you're at, you know, and like you said, injury wise, what you need to focus on training wise, and you can still be studying tricks. You can still be tricking and working yeah. on things. You don't have to be stagnant. Um, one thing I did want to say too, do you think that cross training is something that would be beneficial in this season? Like doing something like yoga or taking a martial arts class or. I think the with the cross training side of it, it has more to do with the stress management. Okay. So tricking as a whole is very, it's a high stress activity. So yeah. I think some of the healthy, healthiest things. And again, this goes to like, when you become an adult and you're doing all these other things is like having a cross training aspect, that's very low stress based, right. but that's also still fun. Like, again, a, I think a trouble, like an area that people get into with tricking is that if we do tricking, if you're a tricker, like you love to trick, it's probably your number one passion hobby that you want to do more than anything. Learning as you get older to find other things you love to do and have that be your cross training, like, like get really into going for hikes, like right. do something like low intensity yoga, like something that like gets you to like relax a little bit and like let go of like the, you know, push at 110% mentality. I think that's a really important thing of cross training um it'd be it's just a murky water where it's like all right like it's my 
it's my rest season. So I'm going to cross train, but then I'm going to go do this other thing that's super, super intense, but like, it's not tricking. So it's like, that does the same thing on your body. Your body doesn't know that you're tricking. It just senses stress. Right. That that's, that's true. I think that the line is actually pretty, it's pretty hard drawn though, because with the tricking, you're, it's acrobatic and you're crashing, you're falling. It's a high impact on your body. And I don't think that as long as it's not similar stressors, I think you could recover. Um, but that's also a very true thing. High intensity yoga <laughs> it is no, because it exists. Most yoga is hard. Yeah. And that's a thing. <laughs> even with like that's normal, true. <laughs> even with normal clients that I see, like, you know, this is all like a, a further like a kind of an expanded look at like what i would take a normal person through like non-tricker basic person they just want to like lose weight there's a lot of people in today's society right now that overtrain, do over stress-based activities like they're doing cardio five to six days a week they're they're lifting weights they're in a calorie deficit and they can't lose weight even though they're like doing all these things and it's because their body's too stressed so it's like all right you have to like reel back some of the stressor stuff like stop doing runs or stop doing hit like you know do some walking yeah. do some hiking do yoga not crazy yoga but reel in the stress so again like the recovery season's all about lowering stress in all of these different areas of life life like lowering stress from nutrition which is food quality lowering stress from training focusing on stretching recovery lowering stress and tricking by working basics and like again like you can still do work on new skills, but like work low impact based skills and tricking, like build a bigger base rather than like build a bigger ceiling. If that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. Another good aspect of like using that season to your advantage. Yeah. We talk about that all the time. Um, there was something else that I wanted to talk about with that. Um, oh yeah. Well with the stressors. So why is it that you need to have to remove the stress in order for your body to to actually lose that weight or to actually start healing? What is it that is causing that disruption? Yeah, so you can think of stress in the human body like an energy bar. Like stress isn't bad, stress gets us to do things. So the stress hormone cortisol acts like an energy almost. Like it's that fight or flight response. It's like when you're, you know, like you're like mid, like you're about to do a combo that you've never done before or a movie you've ever done before. And you're just like, your heart's racing and you just have this like, like zoned in mentality. It's like tapping into like that cortisol stress response. Um, again, that's induced by high impact things. It's induced by running. It's induced by eating away from your maintenance calories. So bulking is actually puts a stress on your body and cutting actually puts a stress on your body. So if we think of stress kind of like an energy bar for the body, anything that we need to do, like we have to use, we only have so much stress that we can use, like a like a hundred percent bar almost. And when right. we're trying to recover, we're trying to lose weight or any of these things, that takes a certain amount of that bar. And so we have to allocate that. We have to pull stressors from different areas and like, okay, I'm gonna stop doing this so that I can now work on this. So I think of it kind of like that. And I think it's a good way to describe it for people. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it's also like, it's also giving your body that, that equilibrium to, to, to allow it to do what it's trying to do. And if you're in this awkward stress up and down, like if you're going between, they're different stressors, right? If you're going between bulking and cutting, even if it's not on purpose, you don't have any level of consistency in your body's guessing, then it makes sense that it wouldn't be able to fix yeah. the issues that it needs to fix. And like a real world example of this, like, cause this seasons can be different for everyone. You can choose what three months you want to recover. So like, say you're a tricking adult, you have kids. It might be really, it might be really useful to make this recover season, like summertime, your kids are out of school. You can hang out with your kids, go on vacation you're still fitting in like one to two easy sessions a week just to move your body, but you're focusing on like having fun and, and like removing stress. So that's again, the way like an adult could fit that into like how their life would be, be able to balance tricking in a way. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And uh, this also goes the other way as well with the uh, not pushing yourself too hard and keeping that leash on yourself. You can't get lazy either. I think those are the two. I, I think trickers go in the extremes. They're either going to push themselves all the way or they're going to do absolutely nothing. And I yeah. think that, yeah, keeping that leash, but also 
finding the balance and still setting the schedule of some kind, um, which is why I thought that cross training was important. Um, hey, Sean, is there anything else you wanted to add? Yes, actually, um, I had a couple questions. <laughs> um, so looking at the nutrition side of things for things that are more nutrient dense or just better food quality in general, like what are usual recommendations that you give? Yeah, so the, the key thing with nutrition is not making it hard for people. Because uh, again, it's like, for me, I can get caught up in I know so much about nutrition, like, it's really easy for me to like, think about these things, because I know all this, but like trying to make things basic for people, simple as it can be as food quality is like, making more foods, making more meals yourself. So thinking of like a whole foods approach. So like less packaged food, less processed food, um it's really as simple as that so like getting good at like grocery shopping regularly like knowing yeah. what to get at a grocery store making sure you have fresh food in your house and not eating out every single day of the week or eating out fast food again those things when i talk to a normal person i think that's fine like people i eat out one to three times a week but it's in balance of you know i make all my meals at home i i use you know four to five ingredients per meal um and focusing on like, again, like high quality foods, like whole, whole natural vegetables and fruit, um, animal protein, um, and focusing on things like that. So again, it doesn't have to be super, it's not like the specific diet or anything. Like if you predominantly eat meat, fruit, and vegetables, then you're doing really, really good in terms of food quality and health. Good. All right. Um, and then with mobility training, that means more of just like learning actually how to expand your like let's say splits, like being able to move your shoulders like past where they should be able to potentially, or like if you have a shoulder impingement, being able to actually move correctly, I guess, in a way of saying it. Because I, I've met people that have issues with moving through certain ranges of movement. So it's really just learning to increase that or be more comfortable with it. Yeah. So it's, and that can be another th thing too. You're tricking your mind. Like we're normally so focused on like a tricking goal of like, I can't double cork yet. So like my energy and focus is like everything I need to do to do that. It's like using again, the recovery season for mobility stuff to be like, Hey, there's this mobility thing I can't do. I'm going to like aggressively attack everything I need to do to get that mobility. So I think again, it's a lot of different things. Like the, the trendy person right now that's been in the media for a while is like the knees over toes guy. Um, yes. he's super, super big on mobility for the lower body. And he does have a lot of mobility stuff for the upper body. I actually went through some of his programs for a year and a half straight. Um, so wow. a lot of my training that I take people through a lot of what's going to be in the book is going to be a lot of similar concepts, um, that he uses. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've, I've heard about the knees over toes guy and I, I thought about, it, I was like, that makes sense. Cause like you natural movement is far outside of like what they usually deem as what you should and shouldn't do. And sometimes you have to kind of train through that and not just ignore it because you'll, cause you shouldn't do backwards. Yeah. That's also where like mobility training doesn't necessarily just mean like I'm passively doing these stretches. Like mobility training can be hard too. It's oh, just yes. like a different kind of hard. Um, so that's why I think like, again, like trickers like to push themselves. If you kind of switch your push yourself mentality to a different area, I think that also helps people get through, like you said, Chris, to not be lazy. It's like, you're still actively working towards things daily, weekly, monthly, where there's still a drive component there where the drive never stops. It's just, what's that drive focused on? Right. Because I think there is a serious addiction here and it's hard to not like it's it's a problem <laughs> that we need to like figure out how to spread it out so that because this is why I think the injuries are occurring because people are just addicted to going hard. So yeah, yeah and, and that makes sense. And people who are addicted, it's very much like they find themselves that it's easier to go all in or it's easier to do none. It's like right. learning how to balance it for an addict, whether it's a vice or whether it's something like tricking. Um, yeah, I think it all still applies that well. And I, I grew up and I did the same thing. It was like, I either tricked all the time or I didn't trick at all because I was injured and there was no balance ever. Right. And then one more thing I just wanted to add to that was that um, with that mobility training and the tricking, I think that there is a missing link that you can use to train during your tricking time where you're talking about like, okay, let's work on the mobility. Why is this mobility applicable to tricking? Because I can land this trick this way. Because in my TDR, my arm can go this way. Yeah. I can look 
farther now or spot this area. So like these different things can be applied directly to tricking. So I think that, that is a really good, yeah. giving yourself that like, reason why you need to trade it. And that's definitely solid. like what the book's meant for to go more into depth on like, not just like here to, here's doing this and why, but like, here's the education, like why this will help you. Here's what you should think about. Like, like you said, like if someone's educated on why they're doing some non-tricking related thing and how it's going to help them with tricking, they're going to probably be a lot easier to like buy into it and apply it and like be like, okay, yeah, this is actually going to help me. Absolutely. That's why I do so much cardio. Cause I'm like, I can get in so many more triple corks if I have the lung capacity to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump on to season two. Perfect timing right there. I'm going to pause this and then we'll jump on the next one. Cool. Perfect. Sounds good. Don't forget to follow us on the underscore flip underscore side underscore podcast on Instagram. And C-H-R-I-S-P-Y underscore T-R-I-X. That's Crispy Tricks on Instagram. And I also have another YouTube channel, Tricks Fix, T-R-I-X space F-I-X for more tutorials and other things. And we'll see you guys next time.